right. Uh, thank you for letting me know. Was not worth it. One second. Apparently, the microphone that I plugged in uh, was not adequately charged, so I'm going to have to switch it. Hi, can you all hear me now? I hope. Uh, <laughs> this was um, not exactly how I had uh, anticipated the stream starting today, but um, technical issues. <clears throat> there are usually uh, three lavalier mics in this room, uh, three receivers, three transmitters. Today, when I came in, there was one transmitter and two receivers. Uh, the paired transmitter and receiver apparently had no charge whatsoever, so they are currently plugged in and connected to the system. Um, thankfully, they let me use them while they're charging. So, <laughs> but, but yeah, the other... Um, I don't know where the other transmitter is. I can't even use the other pair. Uh, and it was the transmitter that had the least charge. I actually had to let it charge for a moment before I could turn it back on. So, um, you know, fingers crossed that everything keeps working. <laughs> but uh, um, hello was not worth it. Hello key squared. Uh, hi Hannah, hi Philip, hi Fluidan. Um, <clears throat> 
and welcome everybody to Archival Adventures. <laughs> Today's Archival Adventure, Technology Issues. Uh, actually, no, but um, uh, today we're returning to the 19th century for some additional time with Godey's Ladies Book. We made it to the 1850s last week and uh, ran across the first in a series of articles about hair that was wildly inaccurate, and so we spent a, a lot of time on that. Um, and we were just having a generally good time with uh, our 19th century ladies magazine. So um, that's what we're going to return to this week for um, probably the last week that we spend with it. We'll <coughs> pardon me. Um, so we'll probably uh, we'll, we'll make it into the American Civil War era. We'll make it to the post-war reconstruction period. See if those show up in the magazine at all. Um, but yeah, that is the plan for today. Uh, thank you for the hydrate. Um, it's partly that I've been having sinus issues with the transition to spring, and it's partly that this room is ridiculously hot. I feel like I'm sitting in an oven right now. <coughs> and there is no airflow in here whatsoever. Anyway, um, let me start with uh, the land and labor acknowledgement, as I normally do. <clears throat> so this is the official land and labor acknowledgement of Virginia Tech, uh, where I am currently located and where the archives that we'll be looking at are housed. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Ut Pro Sim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. <clears throat> so thank you for um, being supportive of me reading that every week on stream. He <coughs> um, squared the background music that we are listening to at the moment uh, appears to be a band called Sense of Comfort. The music that I use on this stream is through Pretzel Rocks, and this is the Chill Guitars channel, um, because the Chill Piano channel was getting some um, copyright strikes, so I have stopped using the Chill Piano ch channel and switched to Chill, chill Guitars. Uh, everything in Pretzel Rocks is supposed to be stream safe for Twitch, but um, something was getting muted uh, on chill pianos, so now we're on chill guitars. Um, but yeah, the band appears to be called Sense of Comfort, or the, the artist. <clears throat> so, Godey's Ladies Book. Uh, for those who were not here last week, uh, let me go ahead and grab some general information. Uh, so basically the information I'm about to share with you is just from the Wikipedia article, it's just primer information, just some basic um, stuff about the magazine. It was published by uh, Louis A. Godey from Philadelphia for 48 years from 1830 to 1878. Uh, Godey intended to take advantage of the popularity of gift books, many of which were marketed specifically to women. Each issue contained poetry, articles, and engravings created by prominent writers and other artists of the time. Um, Sarah Josepha Hale, author of Mary Had a Little Lamb, was its editor from 1837 to 1877, and only published 
original American manuscripts. Although the magazine was read and contained work by both men and women, Hale published three special issues that only included work done by women. When Hale started at Godey's, the magazine had a circulation of 10,000 subscribers. Two years later, it jumped to 40,000, and by 1860, it had 150,000 subscribers. <clears throat> In 1845, Louis Godey began copywriting each issue of the magazine to prevent other magazines and newspaper editors from infringing on their texts. This move, a first in America, was criticized by editors of the Baltimore Saturday Visitor. They called it a narrowly selfish course and stated that Godey would rue it bitterly. The magazine was expensive for the time. Subscribers paid $3 per year. Even so, it was the most popular journal in its day. Under Hale's editorship, the list of subscribers to Godey's reached 150,000. Hale took advantage of her role and became influential as an arbiter of American taste. She used some of her influence to further several causes for women. For example, she created a regular section with the heading Employment for Women, beginning in 1852 to discuss women in the workforce. In general, Godey disliked discussing political issues or controversial topics in his magazine. In the 1850s, he dismissed Sarah Jane Lippincott, um, uh, as assistant editor for denouncing slavery in the national era. Lippincott publicly denounced Godey in response, and Godey later recanted. Nevertheless, he forbade his journal from taking a position during the American Civil War. In fact, during the war, the magazine made no acknowledgement of it whatsoever, and readers looked elsewhere for war-related information. In the process, Godey's lost about one-third of its subscribers. Um, so that apparently answers the question. We're not likely to find any mention of the American Civil War in the magazine as we look through it, because <coughs> apparently they weren't allowed to talk about it. Uh, but what we have discovered in exploring the magazine is all of the hallmarks that we expect of a women's magazine today seem to be present. Um, all of the, uh, we encountered an article that basically criticized women for not being perfect and talked about how they could make themselves more perfect. Um, there was mention of, uh, there was definitely mention of makeup, there was mention, of, there was a whole series of articles on hair, um, fashion, uh, they were particularly known for actual color images of current day fashions in the 1800s. Um, so, you know, uh, fashion, diet, exercise, makeup, hair, um, and gossip, as well as celebrity um, photographs in the form of engravings of celebrities, were all encountered on last week's stream. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we'll see what we find in the second half of the 1800s. As we dive in, I'm going to start again with the 1855 volume that we ended looking at last week. So, hopefully it is a fun adventure. Go ahead and I'm going to switch over to the document cam. I will note this is a rather thick volume. Um, this volume, this bound volume here, is uh, all of the 1855 issues bound into one hardcover volume. Not unusual, honestly, for um, long-term preservation of serials uh, or, or magazines as, or newspapers. Like, uh, magazines and newspapers often get bound into hardcover books. Um, and let me tell you, the, the newspaper ones are really big. Um, <clears throat> right, we were in 1855 somewhere. I don't recall exactly where. So I'm just gonna flip through a bit. They also had all these wonderful engravings. Uh, here we've got one called The Water Lily. Just really good art. And then on the next page, uh, one of the color illustrations <clears throat> of current day fashion. 
with the label at the bottom, Godi's Unrivaled Colored Fashions. Uh, because they were printing color engravings of modern fashion. So we've got, um, it looks like two women here in these dresses. One of them's got a shawl and both of them have bonnets. And you know, this is a pretty typical image for these books. <clears throat> Let's see what else we have. Ladies' cravat or necktie in applique, uh, mosaic tapestry lamp mat. So I assume these would be products that somebody could eventually buy. These are illustrations, yeah. We have a piece here called the love letter. It's like we have the messenger and a woman reading the letter. Child, I don't know. Yeah, the colors are gorgeous in these book in these magazines. Um, I wasn't able to find specifics in quick searches last week to to know for certain the exact process, although we did discover that some of them were hand inked and um, many of them just appear to be inked woodcuts. So regardless, they are, are very well preserved. Residence of G.K. Foster, Esquire, Richmond, Canada. Why? Why this picture of G.K. Foster's house is in the book? I don't know. Mary Lizzie Polka. The, the middle of this magazine here has a lot of image content. We have dresses for young misses. <clears throat> it says, see description. I'm guessing the description is going to be on the next page. Whoops. I bumped the camera. And we have the Alma. From the establishment of G. Brody, 51 Canal Street, New York, drawn by L. Uh, drawn by L. T. Voigt from actual articles of costume. We present to our readers this month the incomparable garments which Mr. Brody has furnished for our book, assured as we are by him that in addition to its admirable style, it is far in advance of its season. <clears throat> the chaste character of its fashion, the elegance of its trimming, and the richness of its material combine a uh, tout ensemble of exceeding beauty. <clears throat> the upper portion is a deep yoke descending to a level with the elbows. This in front, of it, this in front is continued in a uh, Pelerine and forms the front tabs of the cloak, falling with but sufficient drapery to ensure gracefulness and ease to the person. Upon this is box plated the skirt with ample drapery, which rounds fairly over the arms and thus forms the flaps which cover them. The trimming is black ostrich feathers, graduated in width in manner in the manner seen in the engraving. <clears throat> the material of the cloak velvet, is thus admirably contrasted with the plum uh, plumage which adorns it. Although we regard it as the most beautiful of any we have met with in this class of garments. So velvet and ostrich feathers for the cloak here. I still don't see description of the other two dresses though. Worked muslin collar and inserting, inserting in broderie anglaise, inserting for undersleeves, vine pattern inserting initials, corners for pocket handkerchiefs. I don't know. We have a crochet tidy. <clears throat> we have a crochet pattern here for some flowers, it looks like. I do think this was either the very end or the very beginning of an issue.
I'm not certain. I think it's the very end of the February issue. Because here we have the beginning of the March issue. Furs for the ladies and where they come from. <clears throat> Interesting. It is worthy of notice that the more wealthy classes of society are constantly devising new modes of marketing the, uh, the artificial distinction between themselves and those who are not so rich in worldly possessions by a difference in dress. A few years since, this was accomplished quite satisfactorily by means of costly velvets and brocades worn in the streets. Velvet shawls and cloaks and the most expensive silk fabrics then answered the purpose tolerably well, but these have now become quite too common, and our wealthy fashionables have been compelled to resort to the European plan and to distance all competition by people of moderate fortunes by wearing costly furs. This will probably last for a long period, for furs of the higher quality are entirely beyond the reach of ordinary people. We now resume our account of the furs most commonly in use. The skins of hares and rabbits are used, in common with beaver and nutria, or koipu, skins for felting purposes. I have no idea what a nutria is. <coughs> I'm very curious now and must look it up. Nutria. The nutria, also known as the kopju, is a large herb a herbivorous semi-aquatic rodent, classified for a long time as the only member of the family Myocastoridae, Myocastor, is now included with the Echinidae, the family of the spiny rats. Interesting. It's just a big water rat, apparently. Looks sort of similar to a capybara. Um, it's N-U-T-R-I-A, if you want to look it up for yourself. <clears throat> Large, cute rodent. Apparently, they were a, a fur in use in the 1855s for fashion purposes. Uh, they are also dressed and dyed for various other uses. Rabbit's fur is made into cloth for ladies' use, the skins of the finer sorts of this animal being employed for linings, etc., while the skin of the white Polish rabbit forms no mean substitute for ermine. The silver gray rabbit, formerly peculiar to Lincolnshire, uh, but now bred in warrens in other parts of England, is invariably... Uh, invariably exported to Canada and Russia, where it is in great demand and secures a high price. Huh. It has been noted as a peculiar feature of the fur trade that almost every country or city which produces or exports furs imports and consumes the fur of some other place, often the most distant. An article is rarely consumed in the country producing it, but is eagerly sought by another quarter of the globe. A suit of English silver gray rabbit is seldom witnessed in England, and when exhibited is far from being admired as in China. <clears throat> Other skins of less general use are the chinchilla, introduced about 40 years ago from South America where it is exclusively found, the fur seal, divested of its long coarse hair and retaining the curly silky yellow down uh, which, when dyed a rich brown, supplies a fur of velvet-like softness. The tiger, used to cover seats of justice in China and also employed for rugs, etc. The leopard, worn as a mantle by the Hungarian nobles, who formed the royal bodyguard, and used also as officers' saddle clothes by some of the English cavalry regiments. The angora goat, whose long silky coat once formed a costly article of ladies' wear, but is now of small account and is employed chiefly for carriage and drawing room mats and rugs. Buffalo skins, 
which of late years have been largely used in Europe and the United States as robes and wrappers in severe climates. And the cat, which when bred for the purpose, as it is largely in Holland, supplies a useful and durable fur. Um, what? Substitutes for fur have been found in the plumage of birds. Thus, swan's down, goose down, egret down, and the silvery plumage of the grebe are comfortable to, to ladies' use. The down from the egret is so costly that only four sets have been made during a century, the last having been fabricated in Paris for the great exhibition in Hyde Park. Wow. It, then it goes into a little bit about how furs are processed for the market, and I don't think we're going to cover that. Um, <clears throat> but cat? What? <coughs> let's, let's skip ahead a little. So the editor's table, I, I think, is probably going to be rather interesting because um, as noted in the Wikipedia article, the editor at this time was the author of Mary Had a Little Lamb. So I'm interested to see what, I mean, this is just like editor's notes, but I'm somewhat interested because apparently the editor was the, the author of Mary Had a Little Lamb. So, one moment. I'm trying to, I needed to do a little bit of moderation on the other channel here. Um, such that it's not letting me. Um, my. Oh boy. Um, Sorry, it took me a second. Um, all right, so the editor's table. I'm going to take a look at the second item on here, which apparently has the title Chinese Novels. A very copious and on the whole interesting department of Chinese literature is the novel. This term, however, though generally adopted by our countrymen in the East, conveys an erroneous idea to the reader who is accustomed to apply it to a series of adventures, having one plot and one interest. They are what we would call novelettes, or stories. The longest of these, of which Du Halde gives a translation, uh, though filling only 20 pages, includes several plots. In these short narratives, it is not attempted, and indeed, it would be hardly practicable to give any minute de delineation of character or detail of social intercourse. They exhibit, however, a varied picture of human life, including more of its sober realities than was to be found till very lately in similar works in this country, in which the actors were almost exclusively confined to one class, and the interest excited by a single passion. Uh, M. Remusat, who is so well entitled to speak on the subject, observes, <clears throat> the men and women whom they introduce are men and women acting naturally within the circle of their passions and motives. Integrity is to be seen in contrast with intrigue and honest men involved in the snares of knavery. The characters are generally persons of the middle or intermediate classes, such as magistrates, governors of towns, judges, counselors of state, and men of letters. We might be tempted to regard most of them as 
into the private memoirs of some particular families composed by an accurate and faithful observer. Visits and the formalities of polished statesmen, assemblies, and above all the conversations which render them agreeable and the social amusements which prolong them. Walks of the admirers of nature. <clears throat> Journeys. <clears throat> Sorry. Walks of the admirers of nature. Journeys. The maneuvers of lawyers, literary examinations, and in the sequel, marriage, form their most frequent episodes and ordinary conclusions. It may be added that the incidents, as in the drama, follow each other in a lively and rapid succession and are often original and striking. We shall give an example from Duhalda's principal novel. A man whose brother was supposed to be dead endeavored to compel his widow to marry another husband. And from the power attached in China to this relationship, she found herself without the means of resistance. The lady, therefore, as is common with damsels in distress situations in China, determined to put an end to her life, for which purpose she suspended herself by a cord... Uh, it's... I'm just... Uh, to a beam in an inner apartment. I apologize. Uh... I don't know what to warn people about, other than the fact that these items are historical items, and this one is from 1855. Um, I have not read them in advance. I don't know what we will encounter, uh, except that uh, be prepared for encountering sensibilities from 1855, in which case um, talk of self-harm uh, apparently occurs without any warning whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> It so happened, however, that the cord broke and she fell on the floor. Yang, the wife and accomplice of her persecutor, uh, being in the outer room, ran in on hearing the noise, but stumbled over the almost lifeless body of her sister-in-law when, when her headdress was thrown to some distance. At this moment, a knock at the door announced the arrival of the merchant who came to carry off the unfortunate widow. Yang, anxious to avoid delay on an occasion where speed was necessary, yet unwilling to appear without a headdress, hastily put on the mourning one of her sister-in-law and ran to admit the strangers. The headdress happened to be the mark by which they were to recognize their victim. Yang, therefore, was instantly seized and placed in a chair where her loud cries, proclaiming the mistake, were drowned by the sound of trumpets and musical instruments unusual on such occasions, or, sorry, usual on such occasions, and now redoubled to prevent the expected clamor from being heard. Thus she was hurried into a vessel prepared for reception and carried away. It is easy to imagine the dismay of the brother-in-law who found that he had sold his own wife to whom he was attached, while the unexpected arrival of the persecuted lady's husband, whose death had been falsely announced, relieves her from further annoyance. Love and courtship which occupy such a prominent and almost exclusive place in our romance can with difficulty enter into that of a people uh, among whom sexes are so strictly separated that the two parties must not see each other until the day that unites them, and who are required not to take the slightest concern in the affair, but to leave it entirely to be arranged by friends and go-betweens. Yet such is the attractive nature of this all-pervading affection, and of the vicissitudes to which it is liable, that the Chinese poets and novelists, in defiance of all these obstacles, have often contrived to introduce it as a leading theme. <clears throat> Peculiar events and circumstances bring the pair within view of each other and give rise to a secret passion. One youth roaming through a garden looks into an arbor and sees two ladies playing at chess, and though they instantly run away, one of them leaves the arrow in his heart, a lover being admitted into the house next to the abode of a celebrated beauty obtains a sight of her through a chink in the partition wall. By a trick which customs of China render practicable, he finds himself affianced and married to another, possessing none of the charms of his mistress, yet though eagerly desirous to pr prove the fraud, he dares not make any allusion to the stolen glance by which he was so fully assured of it but perhaps the most original mode of falling in love is that of a youth and maiden who happened to live in houses situated on the bank of a river and who in looking out one day saw each other's shadows in the water. The young man observing the lovely image in the stream says, Are you not Yu Kyung? 
Yu Qian. <clears throat> what should hinder our meeting and becoming companions for life? As he spoke, he extended his arms toward the water as if to lift out the object. The maiden gave only a timid smile, but that was enough. The love knot was already tied between the two through the medium of their shadows. So, I'm not terribly familiar with um, uh, sort of Chinese stories, especially Chinese stories that you would encounter in the mid 19th century. Um, this does not strike me as a terribly inaccurate account of what you might encounter in Chinese literature, though. Uh, if somebody knows more and wants to comment, I would be happy to hear it. Um, but yeah, that was interesting. Basically, literary analysis of Chinese literature from uh, the editor of this magazine, who happened to be the author of Mary Had a Little Lamb. Oh, look at this. <clears throat> it's essentially a broadside in the middle of a magazine. I think we're going to read it. The Great Year of Godey's Ladies Book. 50th volume, 1855. Published 25 years by the same proprietor. Great attractions for next year. 100 pages of reading each month. The oldest magazine in America and the only one especially devoted to the wants of the ladies of America and supported as such by the ladies of this country for the last 25 years. We commence this volume with the largest list by many thousands that we have had since we commenced the work. We have, in addition to our many excellent fortunes, to add <coughs> a treatise on the hair and crochet work in colors. We think these new features will be appreciated by our subscribers. All our celebrated core of contributors will favor us as usual with those writings that have made the ladies' book so celebrated throughout our country as a literary standard. Steel engravings! In this department, we have always stood unrivaled, and the same attention will still be given to it to enable us to sustain our proud superiority. Our fashions with diagrams! This department, which has given great satisfaction to our lady subscribers, will be continued. Drawing lessons for youth. We have at least 1,000 designs still on hand to publish. Therefore, this department will be continued with unabated energy. Any child can learn drawing by these lessons. Paris, London, and Philadelphia fashion. The only colored fashions upon which any reliance can be placed, received direct from Paris and adapted to the taste of American ladies by our own fashion editor with full directions. Dressmaking. Our monthly description of dressmaking with plans to cut by. None but the latest fashions are given. The directions are so plain that every lady can be her own dressmaker. Embroidery. An infinite variety in every number. Dress patterns, infants' and children's dresses with descriptions how to make them, all kinds of crochet and netting work. New patterns for cloaks, mantles, talmas, collars, chimises, undersleeves, with full directions. Sorry, that's chemises, I think, but I'm not certain. Every new pattern of any portion of a late... La no, I don't think that's actually... I don't actually know what that article of clothing is. I am distracted by it. <clears throat> Every new pattern of any portion of a lady's dress appears first in the ladies' book, as we receive consignments from Paris every two weeks, having a resident editor there. The nursery. This subject is treated upon frequently. Godie's invaluable receipts upon every subject. Indispensable to every family worth more than, a whole, than the whole cost of the book. Music, three dollars worth in every, uh, sorry, three dollars worth is given every year. Model cottages, cottage plans will be continued as usual. In the various numbers for 1855 will be found the newest designs for window curtains. 
Broderie Anglaise, slippers, bonnets, caps, cloaks, evening dresses, fancy articles, headdresses, wreaths, mantillas, walking dresses, riding habits, and morning dresses. Dresses for infants and young misses, boys' dresses, capes and cloaks of fur in season, patterns for needlework of all kinds, and patterns to cut dresses by are given monthly. Orders for any of the above articles or the clothing for ladies and children, patterns for dittos, furniture, jewelry, head ornaments, etc., etc., will be attended to by remitting to the publisher. Splendid steel, line, and meson tint engravings in every number. They are always to be found in Godey's. Godey's Ladies Book contains precisely that for which you have to take at least three other magazines to get the same amount of information. It is impossible to give, in the limit of an advertisement, a list of all the articles that are published in the book during the year, but every kind of fancy work for the ladies first appears in the costumes of the ladies' book, such as bugle and bead work, painting on velvet, rice shell work, etc. The ladies' book must be seen to be appreciated. Terms, cash in advance, postage paid. One copy, one year, $3. Two copies, one year, $5. Five copies for one year and an extra copy to the person sending the club, making six copies, $10. Eight copies, one year and an extra copy to the person sending the club, making nine copies, $15. <clears throat> 11 copies one year and an extra copy to the person sending the club, making 12 copies, $20. Remember that the postage is only two cents per number. Additions of one or more to clubs are received at club prices. A specimen or specimens will be sent directly to any postmaster making the request. We can always supply back numbers for the year as the work is stereotyped. Subscribers in the British provinces who send for clubs must remit 36 cents extra on every subscriber to pay the American postage to the <clears throat> to the something. Uh, it's cut off. I can't make out what those letters are, and I don't know what it means. Anyway, I am quite interested. Oh, T squared, thank you for. Uh... <laughs> for your appreciation of my announcer voice. <clears throat> I am extremely curious that in 1855, ditto was in use as a, a, as a term. I had no idea that ditto was that old. Um, like, I honestly thought, thought that ditto was like Xerox in that it described a specific process of reproduction. Uh, and therefore, I had thought that it was a much newer term. But apparently, ditto was used to mean reference to the exact same thing as was previously referenced as, er as early as 1855, if not before. Um, which I find fascinating. process was named for the word. Interesting. Oh, you think it's a, a Latin abbreviation that turned into the, a word. <clears throat> yeah, I had no idea um, that I would encounter the word ditto this far back in history. So I, I just, that is, I learned something today, which honestly is the goal of this program every week. Um, <clears throat> And I think we got a name for the process here. Um, mesotint. So these, the coloration process for these images was referred to as mesotint. So. <clears throat> those, those fashions, this is pre-bustle. This is, this is, we, last, week we got to the bustle period, but this is pre-bustle. Would be used in long lists in handwritten documents, like in a census where you don't want to write Child of Rodolphus and Eugenia 12 times in a row or whatever. Okay, and I honestly, now that you, now that you mentioned it, I may have seen that in some census documents. Um, <clears throat> I mean, typically in my experience, it's more common just to see the, the double, like the quotation marks. 
<clears throat> for duplication in a, a list form like that, but I do think I have also seen ditto used there. Um, I just don't think it ever registered to me at the time. Or I didn't remember it well enough to, um, uh, to not have it surprise me now. <laughs> Judy's Antimacassar. Uh, we have... an embroidery pattern, it looks like, of an old woman with a cane. <laughs> oh, when used that way, it's called a ditto mark. I did not know that. <clears throat> Somehow we missed all of these pages last, last week. Oh, you had to do an essay on early printing in freshman history. I have basically no experience in early printing, but I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I think it's really interesting. <clears throat> but yeah, I, I have not done research on it. Let's see, I'm just gonna skip ahead some more. Because I don't want to get bogged down in 1855, although the 1855 year seems to be really, really interesting. Oh, remember how we ended last week with the first in an article on hair? I just found chapter five in a series of papers on the hair. I think we'll take a look. For whatever reason, this is one, one thing you remember from... Um, Hey, it is very helpful having you remember it. Modes of washing the hair. Certain modes of wearing the hair distinguished particular nations. Oh dear. We're continuing with hair description by geographic location and ethnic uh, particularities, apparently. I will just note uh, there is going to be inaccurate information in this article, and it is probably going to be pretty racist. So just beware of that. <laughs> <clears throat> Certain modes of wearing the hair distinguish particular nations. For example, hair twisted in the form of a mitre. Armenians and other Asiatics, long, floating, and curled. Uh, Parthians and Persians, thick and bristly. Scythians and Goths, cut upon the crown of the head. Arabians, Abantes, Mysians, Curates, and uh, Aetolians, long hair, often washed in lime water. Gauls, long, the Athenian cavalry, and all Lacedaemonian soldiers, uh, floating only, <coughs> sorry, long, the Athenian cavalry and all uh, Lacedaemonian soldiers, floating only, uh, bacantes, fastened upon the top of the head, girls, tied and fastened upon the nape of the neck, matrons. To remain or be in the hair was a phrase, especially among the Lombards, to signify unmarried girls who wore their hair long, not twisted into knots like that of married women. In former days, observes a recent writer, what was known of a woman's hair in the cap of Henry VIII's time, or of her forehead under her hair in George III's time, or of the fall of her shoulders in the belt or wing in Queen Elizabeth's time, or of the fullness of her throat in a gorget of Edward I's time, <clears throat> or of the shape of her arm <clears throat> in a great bishop's sleeve, even in our own times. Nowadays, all these points receive full satisfaction for past neglect, and a woman breaks upon us in such a plentitude of charms that we hardly know where to begin the catalog. Hair tight, light as silk in floating curls, or massive as marble in shining coils, forehead bright and smooth as mother of pearl, and arched in matchless symmetry by its own beautiful drapery, uh, um, ear, which for centuries had lain concealed, set on the side of the head like a delicate shell, thrown a lovely stalk 
leading the eye upward to a lovelier flower and downward along a fair sloping ridge undulating in the true line of beauty to the polished precipice of the shoulder whence from the pendant uh, calyx of, a of the shortest possible sleeve hangs the a lovely branch smooth and glittering like pale pink coral slightly curved toward the figure and terminating in five taper petals pinker still folding and unfolding at your own sweet will. I'll be honest, I did not grasp most of what was in that quotation. <clears throat> we give up the ear, pretty or not, it cannot afford to be shown. Any face in the world looks bold with the hair put away so as to show the ears. They must be covered. The curved line of the jaw needs the intersecting shade of the falling curl or of the plate or braid drawn across it. So evident is it to us that nature intended the female ear to be covered. <clears throat> Apparently nature intended the female ear to be covered. I'm, I'm not sure how they got that message from nature, but okay. By giving long hair to women and by making the ears concealment almost inevitable as well as necessary to her beauty. Um, first off, nature did not only give long hair to women. Um, in fact, it is a cultural norm that women grow their hair long in European societies or uh, European-derived societies and that men cut their hair short. Uh, it is no means a biological uh, reality that this be the case. In fact, men's hair, if left to grow, also grows long and covers the ears, unless you put it behind your ear. That's how hair works. They are saying that nature intended women's ears to be covered because women have long hair, which implies that men don't have long hair and that that is the difference because they exist in a binary and analyze things in that way. But they're saying that in order for women to be beautiful, their ears have to be hidden because nature intends for them to have long hair that covers their ears. <laughs> it was not worth it. Who wants to see ears? On this program, I don't have ears. Streamers who wear headphones don't have ears. <clears throat> um, that we only wonder the wearing it covered uh, by hair or cap has never been put down among the rudiments of modesty. In or out of fashion, we contend that curls are preeminently beautiful and becoming. <clears throat> As weapons aimed at men's hearts, no other revolvers are half so deadly. They look youthful, they look modest, they look caressing. The cheek is brighter for the foil they are to its luster. Grace is in their fall over the temple. Poetry has idealized and embellished the general impression with regard to curls. Their motion coquets with the eyes, uh, with the eye and the perplexed light and shadow that play in and out of the nests of curve and trap the fancy. Few faces are beautiful enough to do without them. Few faces that have a profusion of them, gracefully worn, are unattractive. <clears throat> so the author of this article is claiming that most women aren't pretty enough to go without curls, but most women are pretty if they have curls. And they're stating this as an objective fact, not as a subjective opinion, which it in fact is. <clears throat> Yet of late years, Fashion seems to have rejected curls. The rarest beauty in the world is hair becomingly joined on the, on the neck behind. Usually, of course, the bandeau or braid should be so brought round from the temples as to conceal the roots of the hair without so increasing the bulk as to give that part of the head an animal expression. 
This is the point we often see ill-managed in hairdressing. But of all the arts decorating the head, the one which requires the most skill and taste, not to say good sense, is the locating the bulk of the hair when put up. Phrenology, which is not accurate science, phrenology is bunk. Phrenology is complete bunk. It has no actual basis in biology or um, in actual scientific method. It is flim flam. It is not to be believed. Phrenology should be called in for the proper point to receive addition dis, uh, differs with every different formation of skull. Woman has very much the advantage over man in this respect. She can make her head show phren phrenologically for pretty much what she pleases. The prominent propensities may be made unconspicuous by counterbalancing even where the bumps themselves cannot be concealed. But upon most of the betraying prominences, complete disguise may be put, and those which are cred uh, creditable and beautiful may be greatly thrown into relief, heightened, and made to tell upon the expression. An inch forward or backward in the placing of the knot of the hair gives the head, the most common observer sees without knowing why, a very different character. How often do we wonder what it is that makes this or that lady's head so invariably dignified or stylish, when in fact it is nothing but her tact at rightly locating the bulk of her hair? How often, remarks a writer in Blackwood's magazine, do we see a really good face made quite ugly by the total inattention to lines? Sometimes the hair is pushed into the cheeks and squared at the forehead so as to give a most extraordinary, extraordinary pinched shape to the face. Let the oval where it exists be always preserved, where it does not let the hair be so humored that the deficiency shall not be perceived. Nothing is more common than to see a face which is somewhat too large below, made to look grossly large and coarse by contracting the hair on the forehead and cheeks, and there bringing it to an abrupt check whereas such a face should enlarge the forehead and the cheek and let the hair fall partially over, so as to shade and soften off the lower exuberance. <clears throat> oh boy. A good treatise with examples in outline of the deficits would be of some value, value upon a lady's toilet, uh, who would wish to preserve her great privilege, the supremacy of beauty. Some press the hair down close to the face, which is to lose the very characteristic of hair, ease and freedom. Let her locks, says uh, Anacreon, lie as they like. The Greek gives them life and a will. Some ladies wear the hair like blinkers. You always expect they will shy if you approach them. A lady's headdress, whether in a portrait or for her daily wear, should, in, in, as in old portraits by Rembrandt and Titian, go off into shade, not to be seen too clearly and hard all round, should not in fact be isolated as if out of sympathy with all surrounding nature. The wigs of men of Charles II's time had at least that one merit of floating into the background and in their fall softening the sharpness of the lines of the dress about them. We do not presume to enter into the question whether short curls are more becoming than long ones, or whether bands are preferable to curls of any kind, because as the hair of some persons curls naturally, while that of others is quite straight, we consider that this is one of the points which must be decided accordingly as one's style, or the other is found to be most suitable to the individual. The principle in the argument of the hair around the forehead should be to preserve or assist the oval form of the face, as this differs in different individuals. The treatment should be adapted accordingly. The arrangement of the long hair at the back of the head is a matter of taste, as it interferes but little with the countenance. It may be referred to the dictates of fashion, although in this, as in everything else, simplicity in the arrangement and grace in the direction of the lines are the chief points to be considered. One of the most elegant headdresses we remember to have seen is that worn by the peasants of the Milanese and uh, Ticinese. <clears throat> they have almost uniformly glossy black hair, 
which is carried round the back of the head in a wide braid, in which are planted at regular intervals long silver pins, with large heads which produce the effect of a coronet, and contrast well with the dark color of the hair. Lee Hunt very justly reprobates the vile and injurious practice of curl papers. Ladies always delightful, and not the least so in their undress, are apt to deprive themselves of some of their best morning beams by appearing with their hair in papers. All people of taste prefer a cap, if there must be anything but, a, but hair a million times over. To see grapes in paper bags is bad enough, but the rich locks of a lady in papers, the roots of the hair twisted up like a drummer's, and the forehead uh, staring bald instead of being gracefully tendrilled and shadowed. It is a capital offense, a defiance to the love and admonition of the other, admiration of the other sex, a provocation of, to a paper war, and here, and we here accordingly declare that the said war on paper, not having any ladies at hand to carry it at once into their headquarters. We must allow at the same time that they are very shy of being seen in this condition, knowing well enough how much of their strength like Samson's lies in that gifted ornament. Again, five articles in and they're still perpetuating, and why would they not? They had asserted it in the first one, uh, that long hair provides physical strength, as evidenced by the story of Samson. Uh, we have known a whole parlor of them fluttered off like a dovecut at the sight of a friend coming up the garden. Of all nations of antiquity and with, er, with those character, we are at all acquainted. The Greeks cultivated beauty with the greatest care, and by them beautiful and tastefully adorned hair was held up, held to be quite necessary to setting off their persons. Until a very late period, when they had attained to the highest pitch of refinement, they continued to dress their hair in a very simple manner. Dividing it evenly on the middle of the crown, from the forehead backwards, they allowed it to flow loosely on either side in waving ringlets on the shoulders, at the same time turning it carefully so as to form a semicircle along the forehead toward the temples. As Byron described it, those tresses unconfined, wooded by each egan wind, or instead of allowing their brilliant tresses to flow thus smoothly, turned them up and fastened them with a single gold pin. The eyebrows are usually a, of a darker shade than the hair, which serves to give a tone of character to the forehead. Black brows, they say, become some women best, so that there be not too much hair there, but in a semicircle or half moon made with a pen. Winter's Tale. The ancient Romans considered it indispensable for a beauty to have her eyebrows meet. And in Scotland, persons whose eyebrows are so formed are considered lucky. In the East, a powder composed of antimony and bismuth is used to darken the eyelashes. In Circassia, Georgia, Persia, and India, one of the mother's earliest cares is to promote the growth of her children's eyelashes by tipping and removing the fine gossamer-like points with a pair of scissors when they are asleep, by repeating this every month or six weeks, they become in time long, close, finely curved, and of a silky, silky gloss. I will note that after having read that sentence, I must caution you not to try and cut your eyelashes with scissors to try and make them grow. Please do not do this at home. This advice of uh, this, this note in a ladies magazine from 1855 about uh, supposed rumored um, cultural norms within other parts of the world where the author clearly did not live should not be taken as advice on something that you should actually do. The practice never fails to produce this desired effect and is, it is particularly useful when owing to the inflammation of the eyes the lashes have been thinned or stunted. Oh boy. There are so many things wrong in these articles about hair. <sighs> oh, oh, dear. I'm just going to skip on. Let's see what else we have. 
I think we have a pattern here for a fish. It's called fish cloth. And next to it is the bonnet maker's dream. I like the illustrations in the books or in the in the magazine. I think they're good. Let's see what else we can find here. Ooh, we've got some some fashions from later. Uh, I wonder what month this is. I don't know. It doesn't say. It's in good condition. I'm able to just flip through the pages, but I, I don't know what month that we're in. But some more lovely illustrated, uh, colored illustrations of um, 1855 fashion here. Honestly, if you were doing costume design for a period piece, these magazines are an excellent resource. And they're actually not all that rare. Um, we have them here, but I bet if you looked, you probably have a collection somewhere near you that also has a copy. It was in wide circulation, and uh, I would be surprised if you couldn't find a copy somewhere near you if you wanted to consult them. Uh, it's also possible that they would have been digitized and, and be online somewhere. Um, I don't know, though. Um, and I will note, I do not have them in my collection, or I absolutely would be sharing them, but um, <clears throat> there were also quite popular and quite uh, good women's magazines for black women in America in the 1800s and 1900s. Um, unfortunately, our collection does not have them. Uh, it would be lovely if we could get them, but um, that would require us finding a copy or having somebody give us a copy. Um, but indeed, they did exist and uh, are also worth looking at. I just don't have them or I would share them. Interesting. Uh, there's an article title here that has caught my eye. I'm going to glance at it, and then we are going to move. Oh no, no. Sorry, it's it's wardrobe of Mary Queen of Scots, but I just looked at the time, and uh, I actually think we need to be moving on from this volume pretty soon. But, but let's glance at this real quick. Among the items in Mary in Queen Mary's wardrobe inventory, uh, we observe. Ein little hat of black taffety, embroidered all over with gold, with a black feather and gold band. Another hat of black taffety, embroidered with silver, one of black velvet, embroidered with silver, and one of white crisp crepe. Also, a little gray felt hat, embroidered with gold and red silk, with a feather of red and yellow. The royal colors of Scotland. These belonged to her riding attire, but she also had a rich variety of hoods, coifs, calls, bonnets, and coronets of cornets of velvet, damask, crepe, and other costly materials embroidered with gold, silver, silk, and pearls. With these she wore her regal frontlet of jeweler's work and gems. Her veils were, for the most part, of crepe, uh, passamented with borders of gold, embroidery, and pearls. The following quaint, uh, quaintly described article of Orient Oriental luxury in Mary's wardrobe inventory appears to have been an anticipation of the modern parasol for defending her face from the too ardent rays of the sun. A little canopy of cremoisy satin of three quarters long, furnished with fringes and facies, made of gold and cremoisy silk, with many little painted buttons serving to bear shadow afore the queen. Another of these fanciful hand canopies was made of silver damask and carnation silk, fringed with carnation and silver. I So, looking at this article, <clears throat> there are some issues on Project Gutenberg, though they don't always have the complete sets of plates. 
thank you, Key Squared, for sharing that. Um, yeah, if you are interested, you should hopefully be able to find a copy near you. Uh, if you search in WorldCat, I'm sure um, that would help you find it. No longer looking, you've caught glimpses of illustrations that otherwise no clue what's actually going on. Oh, we read another um, in the articles on hair, and it also had some really not great info, although not nearly as bad as the previous one. Um, <clears throat> but the author felt that um, nature intended for women's ears to be covered because women have long hair. And that that was something that um, was the nature of women. Uh, it also brought up the story of Samson in uh, stating that long hair was a good thing again. Um, and went on to relate an anecdote about a cultural practice in some parts of the world that apparently made eye gra eyelashes grow long, but that involved uh, trimming eyelashes with scissors when children were asleep. And I cannot say, um, I cannot say strongly enough how much you should not do this at home. <laughs> but I think we're going to move on from 1855 and look at. Um, one of the next volumes, because I have other ones here. Let's see what year is next. We have Godey's Ladies Book, 1858. And they've gone and They've got an illustrated cover now. Let's see what 1858 has in store for us. Some more lovely color illustrations. Fashions in difficulty, fashions in comfort are the names of these two panels. I do love the mezzotint. Uh, I'm glad that we now know the name of the process, or at least the name that was used at the time. I just think that it's, it's a very pretty coloring process for the images. Um, and then on the next page here, the national cushion. A very patriotic looking uh, seat cushion. 1858. Oh, leave her to her grief. Uh, the broadside that we read definitely mentioned uh, that they would. There would be $3 worth of music in every year's subscription. Ladies netted cap for morning. So I think these are the panels that are supposed to help you to learn how to do some of the dressmaking stuff. Um, so they're illustrating detail work that you can do in making your own dress. alphabet of fancy letters, people-shaped letters. Does anybody know what was going on in 1858? Was there anything particular that happened that year, any month of the year that I should go and look at to see if there's a mention? I mean, it's not particularly a news magazine, and we know that they were prohibited from writing about the American Civil War, but if other stuff was going on, I could always look and see. The Science of Dress, number one. Room for the ladies, for in this subject, as in all others, they have first to be considered. 
a writer of the Quarterly Review who has indulged in a degree of careless bandage, which that journal sometimes allows, declares that however badly the woman dresses, it is the fault of the man, since she dresses herself to please him, and he dresses her to please himself. This is not quite the fact, but that each sex dresses to attract the opposite as well as to please itself is true, and what we have now to consider is how these objects may be attained. Um, again, this is an item from the 1850s, this being 1858, and so the mention of binary, uh, binary gender, um, and the uh, gender roles of the time is to be expected. A becoming dress depends upon its fitness to the wearer, the agreement of its colors within the complexion of the person, and with its own component hues and shapes. Shape. The dress of a young person upon the body of one who is aged can never look well since there is a disagreement between the wearer and the dress. Um, I do think that uh, Hollywood awards shows have given the lie to that statement because there are definitely people of advanced years who wear what would be considered the dress of young people or the dresses of young people and look quite good in them. Uh, so there are definitely people of advanced years uh, older people who wear modern, younger fashions and look great. Uh, so this statement that um, the dress of a young person upon the body of one who is aged can never look well, um, I believe we have proven false. A splendid, handsome, and costly fabric may not look well when made up into a dress. It is a constant remark that things appear better in the shop window than on the back of the wearer. The reason is that when in the window the seller has contrived either harmoniously to blend or contrast the color with others. That dress which is seen to advantage on a tall and graceful lady is frequently like a caricature upon one shorter and ill-made. It does not suit the shape. Um, ill-made is how they chose to describe somebody who is a he of heavier build or you know, has, as would be um, euphemistically stated today, a few extra pounds. Um, they contrast tall and graceful with shorter and ill-made. And indeed, they are actually accurate in that a dress designed to look good on someone who is tall and thin, if adjusted to be on someone who is short and not thin probably won't look good. If you design the dress to look good on someone who is short and not thin, then it will look good. Fashion is designed to fit the body type. Like the, the clothes look good on somebody if you tailor them to look good on that person. Um, so yeah, something that's designed for someone tall and thin that's worn by someone who's not tall and thin isn't going to look great because it wasn't designed to look good on them. Uh, and so much of our fashion industry only designs things for people who are tall and thin. Uh, therefore, for large, large groups of the population, it is hard to find something that looks good on them because everything was designed for the models who are going to model it in magazines, who are tall and thin. Um, yeah, given that a couple of years ago, Rita Moreno came in the same dress she wore in the 60s and looked fabulous in it. Yes, yes. Um, and actually, I, I think, was that the Tony Awards last year? Because um, they were celebrating the anniversary of West Side Story and, and some of the performances with that were absolutely stellar, amazing ones. It is definitely worth watching um, last year's Tony Awards, which were 
not typical and happened at an atypical time of year. Uh, but if you can uh, watch the recording of it, it is, it's worth it. It's really good. Tailoring exists for a reason, but tailoring can only do so much. Current fast fashion is a problem. Indeed. Simplicity in dress, says one of our best essayists, can be scarcely carried too far, provided it be not so singular as to excite a degree of ridicule. The same caution may also be requisite in regard to the value of dress. Though splendor be not necessary, one must remove all appearance of meanness and poverty. So important is this fact that frequently grandeur and harmony of dress are mistaken for beauty of person. A plain woman attired gracefully, richly, and becomingly will, will attract more attention than a pretty woman badly and carelessly dressed. Richness of dress, however, adds little or nothing to the beauty of person. It may, says Shenstone, possibly create a deference, but that is rather an enemy to love and familiarity. <laughs> it's the science of dress. Uh, not actually a science, I don't think. Let's see what else we can find in here, because uh, I do have two more volumes to kind of glance at today, so I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to try and just um, stop at things that we find particularly interesting. The old style. Some more lovely dresses. We're starting in this um, we're moving towards bustles, it looks like. We had bustles. I think we had bustles before. We had, I don't remember the order of things. We still have the bell dresses. But if you look at this dress over here, the, the, the white one that just has the purple flower, the back of the dress extends out a little bit further than the front of the dress, um, which is moving towards more of that bustle shape where it's more sleek on the sides and front and just poofs out at the butt. Um, I'm not certain, Hannah. I would not be surprised. I don't particularly know what tatting is myself. Uh, so it would be hard for me to identify if it is in here. Um, oh, so it's for lace making. Um, I'm not sure that I've seen anything in particular about lace making. I've seen patterns for cross stitch. I've seen um, patterns for detail work on dresses, but I don't think I have specifically seen anything um, specifically on lace. Uh, that's not to say that it's not there. It's just I haven't noticed it if it is. Um, but we can keep an eye out if we're if, as, as we're looking through, we can always, if we see it, we can note it. But I wasn't looking for it before, so I am not certain. Uh, for the bosom of a boy's shirt. Is, is this. Trimming for drawers is that. And in the middle we have lamp or vase mat. mat. We have a, it looks like a color embroidery pattern here. Green and red with flowers. Or cross stitch, I'm not sure. I don't know what, which one is called what. I know the terms, uh, but my brain doesn't, doesn't uh, classify them properly. I would have to actually look them up to know which is which. Um, a pattern here for silk embroidery. I think this is cross stitch. I'm not certain though. <laughs> Hannah probably could tell me. <laughs> so still lots of patterns being given so that people can make their own stuff. This is three years on from when we read the, um, the broadside that said cross stitch. Okay, thank you. So we have, uh, 
was a doily in Flanders uh, Gapierre. The ground of this doily is in square netting, uh, with which our readers are already familiar. This is done in coarse cotton and the pattern by darning with the finer kind. The stitches can readily be copied from the engraving and a netted lace border should finish it. All the darning should be done without leaving any ends of thread, and the best way to do this is to join on the new needleful by a weaver's knot to the end of the last. The lace should be netted round the doily, not sewed on it. All the set may be made of different designs, if desired, but the one we give looks extremely pretty when worked. So there's a mention of lace. Crochet alphabet. Also, you could take this, this crochet alphabet here, um, and this is an 8-bit alphabet. If you're doing 8-bit designs, uh, here you go, here are the letters. I mean, eight bit and like cross stitch or crochet. That alphabet would have been used in the fillet crochet, not something you've ever actually attempted. I just, I just like that it's, it's the boxes, um, and the same person who designed how to get the letters to appear properly in this method of crochet, the same skill set required to work out how to make the letters look correct in this is the same skill set that you would use to work out how to make the letters appear correctly in an 8 or 16 bit design. Each box equals one single crochet stitch. That's, I just, the similarity between the two t is, is striking to me. We have science of the dress part two. Let's see what else we can find here. I just, I love the, the colored in photos. They're not photos, um, they're engravings. Sorry, I, I apologize for the camera bouncing around. Um, I love, uh, so we still have the big poofy dresses, the layer cake dresses. Um, we have a young girl here who's in a very tailored jacket and um, instead of a bonnet has more of a almost a cowboy hat style hat. Um, and then the little boy over here wearing a dress because um, boys and girls used to be dressed in dresses. It was quite common because they were easier to sew and easier to clean. Um, so yeah, that, that's a common thing. As you can see here, the bleed through in the page. Um, and they, d they designed the book for this. They knew. Uh, this is 1858, Hannah. Um, they knew that it was going to bleed through, which is why these two pages are intentionally left blank. Um, just the tiniest little bit of color there. And in the illustration, the boys have have pants on, but it was not uncommon for boys to wear dresses. Somebody, uh, at one time was researching fashion. We have a note here. Shawls, 1858. 
And they appear to have marked in the book as well, which um, not ideal because from the looks of it, uh, this was done after it was in our collections. Um, thankfully, it's at least done in pencil, which is reversible, but don't write in books. If you go to a special collections, if you go to an archives and they hand you materials, the reason you're allowed to have a pencil with you is to take notes in your own notebook. Don't write on the materials. Please, don't write on the materials. If you do and they catch you doing it, you will likely not be invited back. In fact, you will be invited to never return because you are defacing and damaging the materials. If it's in the general library collection and you write on it, that's one thing. If it's in the special collections, in the archives, you're damaging materials that were chosen to be preserved for a reason, and there's a reason why there are restrictions on what you're allowed to have access to while you're there, why you don't get to have liquids, why you don't get to have ink pens and things like that. Um, I don't know for certain that this happened after it came into our collections, but it would not surprise me. And uh, so I will just say, please don't. Let's see. I want to find the cover of one of these. In the 1858 year. I just want to find the beginning of it. Here we have the beginning of the issue for April 1858. I don't, I still don't know if the patterns and stuff are coming at the beginning of the book or at the end. Tatting was called nodding if you were in England, frivole if you were in France, and only tatting if in America. Interesting. I did not know this. I have watched, um, and in in fact, in some, just from some fiction, because I learn a lot about stuff from fiction that is written by really good authors who research stuff. Um, and then that inspires me to go and learn more about it. Um, I've definitely heard or read tales of um, various uh, instances in history where um, lace making was a primary income for women. Uh, and so, yeah. Awkward terminology on today's internet, though. Don't Google it. Oh dear. Oh. Oh yeah. Oh my. Yeah. Good advice there, Key Squared. <laughs> oh dear. All right. Let's see. I have moved us to another volume. We are Godey's Ladies Book 1862, which... Uh, So this would be uh, during the early part of the American Civil War, based on the history that you've been able to find on tatting, maybe started around 1800. And as noted in the Wikipedia article, we are not going to discover references to the American Civil War in this ladies' magazine, because they were not allowed to write about it. Um, January 1862, we start off with a pullout illustration. A double page pullout illustration uh, with some more of the lovely uh, mezzotinting 
of all of these people in these this lovely 1862 fashion. You can see the hairstyles have changed somewhat. They're not really wearing bonnets anymore. In 1858, they all still had um, bonnets or head coverings on. And now we're down to, um, we've got uh, a feather decoration here. We've got some flowers here and there, but they're not wearing hats and, and bonnets anymore. Otherwise, we still have the big uh, layer cake dresses. Um, but yeah, a lot, a lot more curls. Um, looks like some of them have been putting their hair in curlers. Uh, so yeah, some, some difference to the fashions that we're seeing. We have the drawing lesson. Uh, one of the features that has been in since um, at least 1855. We definitely heard mention of it in the broadside that we read. Um, something for you to learn how to draw by copying the, the picture there. Um, we now have a table of contents. I think there might have been in the 1855 issue as well. I'm not certain. Um, But yeah, table of contents. We've got our music that we're given. We have an illustration of a visiting dress and an illustration of a winter walking dress. And in these, they've got those hats on again. I wonder if that's because these are, these are for going out. But I don't know. That's why I say I wonder. Um, Black cloth pardessus, trimmed with chinchilla plush, a very pretty style. The Castillan, Castilian. Uh, this per peculiarly uh, distingue street toilet is made of velvet, with the yoke trimmed with a rich fall of lace and ornamented with needle wrought embroideries which are bordered by an elegant Passementerie. We have not seen anything this season that surpasses this style in beauty. The Garibaldi shirt. The marine jacket. The Garibaldi shirt. Conspicuous among the Parisian novelties of the season, and to all appearances destined to produce a change amounting to revolution in ladies' costumes is the Garibaldi shirt, which can be had in printed flannel, merino, muslin de laine, printed cambric, foulard, or pique. In shape and pattern, it is made in the same way as a gentleman's shirt, with plates in front, extending just below the waist, full sleeve, small collar, and cuffs to turn down, corresponding with the collar, all being of one material. The ends are left so as to go underneath the dress skirt and are long enough to allow of the shirt hanging over in bag fashion all round, producing an easy and graceful effect. It is the prettiest and most elegant garment that a lady can put on for morning, breakfast, or demi-toilet and is already in great demand in fashionable circles. Amazing! 1862 Parisian fashion. We have what is quite possibly, and I can't say definitively, but quite possibly the first instance of a man's dress shirt being designed to be worn by a woman. In European fashion. And I can't say definitively that it is the first instance of it, but probably fairly early, because all of the fashion that we've seen to this point has been more in line with the marine jacket here of a very tailored cinched in waist uh, to give a certain shape to the body. And here we have a shirt that's loose and flowy and like 
meant to be baggy around the middle um, and designed to be a man's shirt but for a woman. Yeah, we're not stopping on something titled barbarism. Thank you. Let's see what else we got. We only have about 15 minutes left. I love the pullouts where they have like a variety of fashion. These are just gorgeous. Godi's Fashions for February 1862. It would be nice if it turned out it was about emulating your hairdresser, but I suspect we're not that lucky, though I suppose that would be barbarism. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was not spelled that way. I'm going to find at least one more article for us to read before we finish, but first, fashions for April 1862. I'm sorry, I love, so these are not woodcuts, um, these are steel engravings, uh, and then they've been colored through a process apparently called um, mezzotint. And they are just spectacular. I think they are absolutely wonderful pieces of art. Um, uh, the art itself is signed Capwell and Kimmel, SC period. Uh, so I don't know if we can locate the artists. I'm guessing that is probably a company. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna Google it. Capwell and Kimmel. I don't see any. Like what comes up is like eBay sales for framed versions of some of this art. Um, I don't find anything in particular on the artists themselves, which is sad because this is really amazing work. Spring Fashions, 1862. So much fabric. Those dresses have got to be ridiculously expensive. There's so much fabric. And they, like, they can do, they can do ponies. They were able to engrave realistic looking ponies. Like, they just, they do really good work. Everything looks so real. The, the, the faces are typical of the era. They're not super realistic faces, but they're very typical of the era as far as art goes. Everything else is really realistic. All right, the last one I pulled is the last, the, the newest one in our collections. Um, and does not actually have a front or back cover. And in fact, the spine binding is also missing. I mean, it's still bound, but like all of this, the hard cover is gone, uh, but it is the newest volume that we have. And since we've only got about 14 minutes left, I'm gonna look at this. Uh, from the American Historical Print Collector Society, Christopher Kimmel, 
worked as an engraver, lithographer, and printer in New York City with three different printers, Samuel Capwell, 1852 to 1862, Thomas Forster, 1865 to 1870, and Henry E. F. Voigt, 1871 to 1877. Thank you, Key Squared. I love, I love that you all take the initiative and go and look stuff up and then share it in chat because um, I try to focus on like continuing to share the materials and not spend tons of time with you staring at me while I'm trying to do an internet search to find information. So I love that you all uh, are able to go out and get some of the detail. All right. We have jumped another 10 years on. This is 1872, so this would be the post-war period, post-American Civil War. We still have consistency with lovely engravings. Um, interestingly, the date, ah, I got it, got it. 1871 here is being covered up by the drape. 1872 is being held by the baby because this is January. So New Year's and, and you know, the baby is the new year. Um, and we still have the, the pullouts. We have the fold-out uh, fashions for January 1872. Um, the coloration on these has gotten much, much better. Uh, this time it is just signed J.H. Campbell. Nope, J.H. Camp. It says J.H. Camp Phil, but um, that could just be me reading it weird. But um, as you can see, we, we have definitely moved more towards a bustle shape uh, from the... Um, the layer cake dresses, the, the perfectly round dress silhouette. Um, we have moved into more of a bustle silhouette where um, these dresses have a, an abbreviated front uh, that is more up and down in the front, narrower on the sides, and but still lengthy in the back. So um, as you can see here, it's got almost a little bit of a train. Uh, you can also see it on the pink dress over here. Um, sort of, uh, I'm gonna scooch the book all the way over so you can see. Um, sort of flat on the front and then at more of an angle on the back. Um, and, and so it still has a bit of uh, a bump out from the body in the back, uh, which begins to be more of like a bustle that we will, that you see as you move further into the late 1800s, um, when you end up with dresses that are pretty flat on the front and sides, but have that shelf in the back where the butt is. Um, and so we're moving that direction. Hi, Abyssal Icarus. <laughs> How are you? We're looking at 1872 fashion at the moment. Um, in this, uh, it, we've, we've revisited uh, Godey's Ladies Book, which is what we were looking at last week, because um, it was just really interesting. Uh, we are winding down for the day, but uh, having a good time of it. I particularly like this purple dress. We also can see a difference in fashion here, just from 10 years earlier. Um, in some of the fashion illustrations, we've got hats coming back, but the hats are very different. Um, the style of the hair is more pulled to the back. They've still got lots of curls, but in the 1862 stuff, the curls were like pulled up on the sides with flowers holding them there, and now they're, they're pulled around to the back in um, a very different shape. <laughs> Hi, Puddle Glove! It's good to see you. Family in consultation. Who shall be invited? Miss Lollipop's party. These are just, the art in these are really, really good.
parlor adornments, so decorating tips. Um, it is a women's magazine, and since the first issue, we have seen um, it employ tactics of telling women that they're not pretty enough. Uh, it um, <laughs> giving beauty tips, trying to give scientific analysis of hair and what to do with it, which included uh, claiming that hair needs to be long because uh, as evidenced by the factual story of Samson, when you lose your hair, you lose your strength. Um, uh, as well as there's been makeup, there's fashion, there's, um, this is decorating tips here by showing parlor adornments. We've seen engrave, engraved pictures of celebrities. Uh, it's, it's in every way a modern women's magazine, just in the 1800s. It has all of the elements we expect from a women's magazine of today, but it is the 1800s, and I think it's fascinating. Wait, who's about to slide off the chair? Oh, yeah, in, in this image here. The thing is, um, because of the, um, so in these dresses, in order to have the back of the dress push out like that, um, it's got layers, it, 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 there are a couple of ways that it can be done. Um, it's either got uh, a series of like hoops, um, which I don't know that these have hoops. Um, but there's a structure of hoops for like the layer cake dresses. Um, and these are transitional uh, fashion that's moving from the layer cakes into more of a bustle dress. Uh, so they may still have hoops that are just not fully circular. Um, or there would be like a series of like um, structural fabric that is affixed via a belt to sit above the butt. That's sort of how bustles um, bump out and hold the dress aloft around the, the butt area. Um, and so there's structure there that you really can't sit on. So in order to sit in a chair like this, she, it, she's, since she's wearing one of these dresses, she's probably having to sit on the side of her hip because she can't sit directly down in the back because there's a back on the chair and the structure of the dress would not allow her to sit that way. Uh, so she's having to sit sideways on the chair um, and probably only has her hip on like the corner of the chair because of the construction of the dress. Whereas this woman here is sitting in a chair more normally um, and it appears that she doesn't have any sort of hoops in her dress. So it, it could be, it, I don't know. The way she's seated says to me she probably has some structure built into that dress that's preventing her from sitting normally, but it could just be a romantic pose that the artist liked. Um, whereas the older woman here does not appear to have that sort of structure in the dress and is able to sit in a chair more normally. Uh, I don't, I don't know. And because it's an illustration, there's no way to check. But I do know a little bit about um, the, the actual dress construction from this time period and the way that those dresses are constructed um, from having done some theater work in my past. <laughs> it's an area that I actually have some small bit of knowledge. <laughs> let's see, what else do we have? Because we are really close to the end, so let's just, I don't know that I'm gonna find another article to read, or that I even have the time to read one if I found one. But we can look at the February fashions. Ooh, we have a wedding dress for February in the center there. Definitely getting bustles. The pink dress here on the side, uh, you can see the bustle beginning to be constructed. The black dress here, there's a little bit of a bustle. Uh, the green dress has started to get 
even even more of it. like the definition of the bustle in these February dresses is much more pronounced than in the January fashions. Oh yeah, that's a, a wonderful cerulean, the, the blue there. <laughs> oh, a missile. <laughs> I, I, you know, you got me on something that I knew something about and could comment on. So um, I'm not an expert in costume design, but I know a little bit about bustles and dresses. Um, from encountering it previously. I don't know particularly exactly how they would have been constructed in the 1800s. Um, and just from looking at the illustrations, I can't say for certain because I'm not seeing the underclothes. Uh, but I do know um, a little bit about the different methods that were available for doing it. Uh, and, and so yeah, I'm happy to always try and do some um, analysis, the little girl in the hat. <clears throat> so, yeah, this... <laughs> they don't subject the kids to quite the same nonsense. You're right. Although the girl still has the over-the-top hairdo. I mean, just think of how many hours it would take to get those curls and get them properly pulled back and put in place. <laughs> Still tons of nonsense, indeed. I I'm gonna see, I think we're just gonna skip through and just look at the, the fashion spreads here. Um, April, 1872. Yeah, we have, over the course of the spring of 1872, we went from dresses that were slightly showing a little bit of extra volume at the butt, but were still almost looking like layer cake dresses from previous years, to by the time April came, we are full bustle. Oh yeah, the hats. But not all of them are wearing hats, which is, is a thing to note. Because um, previously they all had uh, sort of snoods and bonnets and things like that. And now um, the hats are adornments. The hats are decoration rather than covering the hair. And um, not everybody has one on. The hat on the little girl, yeah. But, and her hair is much less done. <laughs> I love that they've been including a little girl in every single month of fashion for this. Um, in previous years, they also had a little boy that would appear, um, but I think by the 18, I, I don't know, I think by 18, 70s, it might be falling out of fashion for boys to wear dresses. Um, I'm not certain, though. And, I mean, even when it was common for boys to wear dresses, boys wore dresses to run around and play. If they were dressing up to go somewhere, they would have had pants. Um. <laughs> yeah, the hair... As we're moving in towards summer, some of the hair is a little bit less done, a little bit more relaxed, um, less of the spiral curls. Um, but yeah, it does seem like we're getting heavy in the layers on the back. Look at the doll she, that the little girl is holding. I just love that detail of the engraving. Th these are really great. You love everything about the arsenic dresses? The green dye in the dresses would have been arsenic based? Is that what you're saying? I totally believe you. They grant the wearer a 1d4 poison attack. <laughs> um. The illustrator here definitely was 
enamored of the blues, the pinks, the purples, and the greens, as well as that cerulean blue. Here we have June. Um, some of the bustles are a bit less decorated and less severe uh, in the June illustration, which I find interesting. The, the little girl has gotten smaller. And now, um, I think this is a little dog with a rapier and a belt playing with a hoop. Do you see the little dog with the rapier and the belt playing with the hoop? It might be a cat. I'm not certain what animal it is, but it's got a freaking rapier. <laughs> the scale is a bit interesting, yeah. Oh no, I'm sorry, Abyssal. I do not have a lot of control over those. More heavily armed than one would expect. <laughs> Indeed. Um, we are running a tad bit over. A couple of minutes past, but I'm just going to do a couple more of these. I suppose that is meant to be a toy that the little girl is playing with. Oh, I am Puddle Glum. Thank you. Thank you for gifting that sub to Abyssalicorus. Welcome to the Rogues Gallery. Uh, looks like a little pull cart of... <laughs> no more ads for a month, yeah. I wish that I could control them. I wish I could just turn them off. Unfortunately, Twitch does not allow that. Godie's Fashions for December, 1872. Uh, December, we have a wedding dress. It appears that we have, um, it, rather than a young girl, we have a young boy, or possibly a young girl in pants. Um, I do, I love the purple. I think of these, my favorite is probably this dress here that is, the, the decoration on the dress matches the like leaves in her hair. And I just think the, the little, like, it's a white dress with a little bit of green on it. And it's just, I think it's really pretty. Um, it's just really interesting to see these fashions because these are so, so detailed. These illustrations are so intricate and the, the engravings are so detailed. Um, like these are honestly the perfect resource for a costume designer doing a period piece set in the 1800s. Uh, I, I just, they're really, really good. And, and honestly, we spent time reading articles that were shocking to say the least. The articles, uh, especially in 1855, that talked about hair. Wow. Um, but the illustrations, the, the, like, if for nothing else, Godey's Ladies Book survives to this day as some of the most amazing engraving art I have ever seen. Uh, the, the engravings of the fashions um, tinted with the mezzotint process are absolutely gorgeous and those artists deserve to be known. Um. <laughs> yeah, uh, the art itself has um, like the artist's signature, but that's about it. There's no note of credit for the artist in the magazine itself. Uh, and therefore, there's not a lot known about the artists. So um, we are past 4.30, and I do need to start winding down so that I can head home at the end of my day here. Um, so 
So let me look and see who we're going to go ahead and pop a raid over to and just see what all is going on. See if there's anybody who we might want to pop in on. I mean, I would love to, but nobody's doing anything like particularly fashion. I mean, it, this was, this was the women's magazine, though, Abyssal. This was not just, just a women's magazine. This was the women's magazine of the time. Um, this was like, this was like the Seven Sisters, but it was the one sister. Like, there were not six others. It was this. And it, it had heavy influence. Um, among white, middle to upper class American society. There were other magazines for black women. I do not have them. I wish I did, but I don't. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna set up, we're gonna pop over to Monterey Bay. Um, it looks like they just have the bay cam on today, so you can watch the water come in uh, on the shore and have some nice relaxing background for the rest of your day. I hope that you all had a good time today. I hope that I see you again soon. Um, we'll have something else from the archives next week. I don't remember what, uh, but tune in at 2.30 p.m. <laughs> Eastern on Wednesday of next week um, to find out. And um, yeah, until then, uh, have fun exploring some history or something. Thank you all for joining and I will see you next time.